Yeah. That's not the first slide, that's, that's a simulation program. So I'll go back to the first slide here. Okay, okay let's, let's begin. Um, about 15 years ago, um, a friend of this college called Adrian Pagan was hired by the Bank of England to advise them on macroeconomic modelling. And he advised them that DSG was the frontier, and um, so the bank um, switched to DSG modelling. Well, Australia has produced uh, more than one debunker of DSG, and uh, Steve Keen is the most recent one, and a very vibrant one. So it's a pleasure to welcome him. Thank you, John. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation as well. Um, this is just uh, my, my debunking uh, predominantly occurs in this uh, particular book called De Debunking Economics, a second edition. Are you thinking of getting the, sh the slide shut the, to make the swing? No, no, it's, a, it's, uh, it's electronic. It's electronic. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> because it's easier to see. So I wrote the first edition of this book back in 2000 Oops. and went on to the second edition. Oh, oh dear, see. It's the first bit, may not be able to. <laughs> went on to the second edition uh, just, just last year and I thought I really had to update the critique, which is mainly about micro in the first edition. And the, the book went from being 120,000 words to 215. And most of the increase was attacking DSGE and what passes for macroeconomics in today's economic world. Now, trying to get this to advance, let's see what's happening there. Hang on. on. Nothing is happening at all. Look, I've got to be reaching over here by the looks of that. Let's see. It's supposed to be on. Right, okay. I'm going to be doing a bit of a monkey performance here, jumping from a keyboard. Unless I can bring that closer, let's see. Yes, I can do that, okay. So, what I'll talk about today is not the, the content of the book so much as going from that to the modelling I'm trying to put forward as an alternative approach to macroeconomics. But uh, to start with why we got into this crisis, let's take a look at what neoclassical advice, largely informed by the DSGE model, was telling us to expect in the near future. And this is the chief economist of the OECD writing in June of 2007, two months before the crisis is now regarded as having started. And the OECD told us the future looks benign. We're going to have a soft landing in the US, a recovery in Europe, uh, and sustained strong job creation and falling unemployment. And that was based on the OECD's small macroeconomic model, which they write in consult consultation with the treasuries of most uh, countries around the world. Ben Bernanke was much the same. He promoted the whole idea that the American economy in particular, but the global economy as well, was going through a great moderation, reductions in volatility and falls in unemployment and the rate of inflation. And this was the trend they saw, that inflation and unemployment were falling over time from 1974 to peaking in 1980 and heading down ever since then. The black line, by the way, is the U6 measure of unemployment, which I regard as more comparable to what happened back in the Great Depression than the U3 measure that's currently used, but there is the trend, peaks falling, lower inflation, lower unemployment, lower volatility. And that looked all really, really good until it all went totally pear-shaped in 2007-2008, unemployment going through the roof and prices going from inflation to deflation. And in many ways the neoclassical response to this was this was something you simply couldn't predict. Nobody could have seen this coming. It was seen as being an unpredictable event. Well, that's a bit of a prelude to a model I'll be showing you later that generates both the Great Moderation and the Great Depression, so-called. Uh, and the Queen, of course, is one of the people to acquire a challenge and say, well, if this was such a big event, how come you didn't see it coming? This is at a seminar at the London School of Economics. And the uh, professor at the time said, well, everybody else was looking at somebody else thinking they were doing the right thing. And uh, it all occurred behind our backs. We couldn't see it happening because here we we're looking at this data and it all looks great. Well, to some of us, what was happening was as obvious as the nose on a black swan. And that was a rising level of debt to GDP over the previous 40 to 50 years in America, which was completely ignored by neoclassical theory. And what we really had wasn't a sustained improvement in the economy. It was a debt finance bubble that was heading for a bust at some point, had to bust because the rising level of debt simply couldn't be sustained by incomes. And there was a group of about a dozen economists who were identified by Dirk Bessemer as having seen this crisis coming, 
I was one of them. Uh, there's certainly more than that number who saw it coming. There weren't that many who actually stuck their neck out and said it was going to happen in any loud and vociferous way. But uh, the 12 of us got a Guernsey for being both loud and vociferous and correct about the crisis coming. And looking, I mean, there's quite a range of theory approaches that I'm seen as being very near, no, very uh, post-Keynesian in my approach. So is Lynn Godley but, and Michael Hudson. Eric Jansen is a commentator rather than a strict economist, but would be more Austrian inclined. Uh, Richard Barker, Austrian. Rebaini, a version of neoclassical. Robert Schiller, the same. Peter Schiff, definitely Austrian. So there's a range of schools of thought there. It's not all one school of thought. Um, but they said the four factors they found in common were a distinction between real and financial assets, a concern with debt, seeing growth in debt becoming a determinant of economic performance, uh, looking at the recessionary impact of uh, bursting asset bubbles in a fifth factor, emphasizing the role of credit. Now that puts us completely outside the neoclassical mainstream. And the way that I see the process operating is that rising levels of debt actually finance economic activity during a boom. And what causes a depression as opposed to a recession is a sustained fall in the level of debt, meaning aggregate demand falls below aggregate supply. This is looking at the level of government debt and private debt in America from 1920 through to now. And you can see that in the uh, 1930s, the debt level, I hope the pointer here works, let's see, does it work? Ah, no, doesn't appear to, okay. Uh, but the debt level in America, the private debt level reached 175% of GDP in 1930 and then blew out to 235% due to both the deflation price deflation and a collapse in real output at the same time. Then fell right back down to 45% of GDP in the end of the Second World War and rose from that point on to reach a peak of over 300% of GDP before the bubble finally burst. Government debt, which is what the politicians normally obsess about, and neoclassical theory actually obsesses about as well, was declining all the way through, and even with all the panics about how unsustainable government debt now is, it's substantially less than it got to be at the end of the Second World War, and it was paid down quite successfully after that period. So the politicians are obsessing about uh, a level of debt which is one quarter the scale of the part of debt they're ignoring, the level of the private sector debt. Now, what I'm going to argue to you is that GDP is not the only source of aggregate demand. GDP plus the change in debt gives you total aggregate demand. And if you take a look at the role of changing debt and say how much does additional debt add to demand, across the entire economy, the answer is enormous. In 2008, the increase in debt in the American economy was roughly $4 trillion, on top of a $14 trillion GDP. So in that particular year, the boost that the changing debt gave for aggregate demand, which is spent across not just commodity markets, but also asset markets, was 28% above the level of GDP. When the crunch hit, the very depths of the crunch, the reduction in debt was cutting aggregate demand by 18%. So you went from being an $18 trillion economy to a $12 trillion economy in two years. And that's why it was such an enormous smash onto the, onto the economy. That's why this is the Great Recession and is now being rephrased as the uh, Great Contraction and I think it will ultimately be called the Second Great Depression. Now, looking back at the 1920s, which we know was a, a de de depression, the boost to aggregate demand from changing debt then was actually smaller than we're experiencing now. So back to the peak level, of the peak increase in debt compared to GDP was about 9%, about 1926-27. The downturn they finally suffered was as steep as we're getting now, 18% reduction in aggregate demand from falling debt. So we're going through a bigger experience now in terms of the size of the transition, but the depth of the downturn is much the same. So it is comparable to the Great Depression. And it explains what can't be explained by conventional economic theory. You, you, when you watch, watch Bernanke's performance, he's quite honest. He says, he literally said, I think the direct quote is, we haven't got a handle on why the recovery is being so slow. They can't explain what's going on. That's because they ignore the role of private debt. Now here's the stats on inflation and unemployment again, and now I'm including the break that occurred when the Great Recession began. I define debt finance demand as being the change in debt divided by GDP plus the change in debt. So I'm saying how much of the change in debt actually explained the downturn. If you then correlate that, that factor, the change in debt divided by GDP plus the change, that gives you the blue line. 
that's the debt finance presented <coughs> aggregate demand, and the U3 level of unemployment is shown next to it. The correlation there is fairly impressive. It's a negative correlation because when debt goes up, unemployment goes down, and vice versa. And that's the correlation running from 1975 to now, through a dramatically different range of economic circumstances over that time period. So empirically alone, it should be taken notice of. But neoclassical economics continues to ignore the role of debt in causing both the booms and the slumps in a capitalist economy, which is bizarre. Now, the same thing applied back in the Great Depression. If you take a look at inflation and unemployment in the Great Depression, the same basic pattern applied. The sudden explosion in unemployment and a true collapse into deflation. Take a look again at that role of debt finance demand. The same relationship applies. And the correlation back then, larger. Working with annual data, so not quite as reliable. But again, empirically, there's something to be investigated here, which is still being ignored by neoclassical theory because it's in their blind spot. Now, there's one further step on from this analysis, because if I'm saying aggregate demand is GDP plus the change in debt, then the change in aggregate demand, which tells you whether your economy is going to grow or not in a, in a, in a, uh, a credit-driven <coughs> economy, is the change in GDP plus the acceleration of debt. And that's where you get the dramatic swings that we're seeing occurring right now because what was first called the credit impulse by Biggs, Meyer and Peck, I have to admit I was a bit of a coward here. I uh, would normally have dived into anal analysing this because the relationship was obvious to me, but I didn't think the data would support it, therefore I didn't look. And Biggs, Meyer and Peck did take a look and they found a very strong correlation between the acceleration in debt and the change in GDP. So they called it the credit Im Im impulse. I think it's better described as a credit accelerator because it's with us all the time. An impulse applies something which is only there occasionally. And, of course, the change in GDP dominates what happens to change in employment, but the credit impulse, which is the acceleration in debt divided by GDP, to get an empirical measure on it, is what really made this the Great Recession, because the, the blue line there is the change in employment, the red line is the credit accelerator, going back to 1955. There's never been a rate of deceleration of debt like this in the post-war period. It's roughly five times as large a rate of deceleration it was ever seen before. <clears throat> and the correlation coefficient, which stunned me when I saw it, because what I'm correlating here is the first differential with the second differential of economic data. And it's bizarre to get a correlation that high between those two factors. So it shows the importance that the, the fundamental empirical role that you can find for, for credit in the economy. And to compare it again to the Great Depression, looking back at that period and saying how deep was the downturn then, the, uh, again, the correlation across that entire time period is still extremely high. The maximum negative credit impulse during the Great Depression was minus 15%, we're at minus 25. So it's no exaggeration to say this can only be compared to the Great Depression, and in terms of the impact of it from the private sector of the economy, it's bigger than the Great Depression. So that's why the US is in a crisis and it's driving asset prices as well as GDP. Now, taking a look at the, uh, because the change in the acceleration debt is also related to the change in asset prices, that is the relationship between the acceleration of mortgage debt and house price change. Again, a very high correlation over that 20 year period, about, about 0.7. So what actually causes rising house prices is accelerating mortgage debt. When we went into deceleration, that's why the prices collapsed so much. And they've still got a long way to go, in my opinion. Now, why did neoclassical economists not see this coming? Well, it comes back to the model through which they view the world. People think economists are experts on the economy. They're not. Even I'm not. We're an expert on the model of the economy. If our model's correct, we know what we're talking about. If our model's misleading, we're useless, or even worse, we're dangerous. Now, the DSGE model, it's taken over uh, master's and PhD education in economics and has become the model of choice amongst neoclassical macroeconomists is like the ISLA model that preceded it, a non-monetary model. So money is not part of the equation, therefore debt's not part of the equation. Straight away there's a blind spot. Now the reason it took over is because it's based on microeconomics. That's its main advantage. It's supposed to be based on microeconomic theory. And here's Oliver Blanchard writing in an incredibly embarrassing paper given the date that it came out. This paper was published on August 12 or 13 of 2008, one year and six days after the crisis began. I'm talking about the DSGE model, said it's simple, convenient, replace the ISLM, 
And its advantage is that unlike ISLM, it's formally rather than informally derived from microeconomic theory. And that's seen as a strength. It's not a strength, it's a fallacy. And this comes down to one of the great paradoxes that I realized while writing the second edition of Debunking Economics. And that is that neoclassical economists don't understand neoclassical economics. They do not know their own literature. And therefore they're ignorant about the, whether they could in fact base macroeconomics on micro. Now one amazing thing about this is that we're now finding that one of the bastions of building neoclassical theory is one of the world's leading critics of DSGE modelling, it's Robert Solo. And I'm sure most of the DSGE modellers don't know that Solo's trying to demolish what they're doing. So he talked about the, the foundations of the DSGE model, and that treats the entire economy, the pure, the pure version of the real business cycle model, which Kidlin and Prescott uh, concocted, treats the entire economy as a single household, which is the only consumer of the only commodity, working in the only firm that operates in perfect competition, etc., etc., etc. This is Solo's words. It's his summary of it. I, I could be satirical about it, but this is Solo. He said, it's nothing but the neoclassical growth model, which he invented along with Ramsey. And he said, now, when I built the model, it was clear what it didn't apply to, short-run fluctuations, the business cycle. But now, any article calling itself about the business cycle, writing back in 2001, will be a slightly dressed up version of that model. He said, the question I want to circle around is, how did that happen? That there's no foundation in microeconomic theory for this model. Now, the reason was, he said, well, let's say you tried to defend this theory and say that, how could you defend using this model as the foundation for macroeconomics? He said, you could say there's no other way to meet the claims imposed by sound economic theory. And this is Solo again. I didn't have to write this. I could quote him. This claim is a delusion. Now, why is it a delusion? Because of something it calls the Sonnenschein Manchild de Brewer conditions. Now, just quickly, is any, who would people in the room have heard of that, those theorems before? But you put, put your hands up clearly. Okay. Uh, the people I'd like to know about it do in this room. Normally, I asked that same question at a meeting of the Australian Economic uh, Association conference this year. Three people put their hands up. They were all the presenters. The other hundred in the audience had no idea, including quite a few professors and, uh, and senior lecturers, PhD students, and so on. So these theorems prove that a market demand curve can have any shape at all that you can describe using a polynomial. And that means that if you derive a downward sloping individual demand curve and then aggregate lots and lots of those downward sloping individual demand curves for a single market, you will get a squiggly line, which is not what students are told. Now, that means you can't even model a single market as a blown up single consumer. You cannot draw, you have no justification for drawing a downward sloping demand curve for a single isolated market once you think in a general equilibrium framework of markets in general. But DSG models model the entire economy as a single blown up consumer. So they're two times invalid. Now, what they actually are is, is to prove that what's called the law of demand. And economics must be the only discipline on the planet where its laws are always broken, apart perhaps from the laws on speeding. So the law of demand says that if you increase the price of something, demand will fall. Drop the price, demand will rise. And that's proved using a Hicksian compensated approach for an individual isolated consumer. But when the good quality neoclassical economists try to generalise that result to see does it also apply at the market level, they hope to prove that it did and they prove that it didn't. So even if you're summing individual demand curves that look like this, here's Robinson Crusoe and Man Friday on the same island with their perfectly downward sloping demand curves for coconuts. You add them up and this is what the market for coconuts looks like. So you can't even do a single market with a downward sloping demand curve. Now what really happens with that theorem is proved by contradiction. You, set a, you assume the market demand curve does obey, obey the law of demand. You then derive the conditions under which that's true. And you then find those conditions contradict the assumptions you needed to set up the, the situation of more than one consumer with more than one commodity. It's the same way that the Pythagoreans proved that square root of two was an irrational number. But unlike the Pythagoreans, who then grew up and accepted the existence of irrational numbers, economists continue to pretend the law of demand applied, not just at the level of a single market, but the entire economy, and therefore invented DSGE modelling. 
Now, there were a few rational reactions amongst neoclassical economists to this, and my favourite is Alan Kerman, writing in the Economic Journal in 1989, in the conference volume proceedings. And he said, one way to react to this is to say, well, if we simply can't add up a whole range of heterogeneous consumers and get a single market demand curve, maybe we can work at the level of groups. Fundamentally, that's restoring classical economics by saying we should think in terms of social classes to do macroeconomics. It's a valid way of reacting. And he said, therefore, demand and expenditure functions should be defined at some reasonably high level of aggregation. That's how we should have responded to that finding. And said, so the idea we should start at the level of the isolated individual is one we may have to abandon. Now, that's a sane reaction to this finding. Unfortunately, most didn't even know about the conditions at all. Now, I was pleased that with the, with the, web, uh, the blogs for these days, you can find wonderful comments to establish what people do and don't know in stream of consciousness mode. And here's Mark Tomer, a you know, very well-known American neoclassical, saying he learned he should read these old papers. They appear to undermine representative agent models. <coughs> he said, I didn't understand the extent to which the representative agent models are only an analytical convenience to work around this problem. And note this one, the DSG theorists who understood this kept quiet about it which is a great claim to make about an academic discipline. Now, I wish they had kept quiet because they're even worse than keeping quiet. They had literally insane reactions to this theorem, the worst being the person who first discovered it. What I find remarkable about this particular quote is the year in which it was made, because I was born this year. This has been known for almost 60 years. It's the first person to discover it was Gorman. And he said that working in terms of whether you could derive a, a set of indifference curves for an entire community, which was fundamentally the same issue of whether you can aggregate individual demand curves and get well-behaved demand curves, he said you can if and only if the angle curve, which shows you the, how, in, how a consumption changes with income, the different individuals are parallel straight lines. Now, what he also didn't realise is that if you have par a parallel line and another parallel line, and they both, both pass through the same point, they are the same line. Now, because the theory only allows consumption based on income, all these points pass through zero, zero. So it's even worse than the way he states it here. Now, look what he says here. The necessary and sufficient condition is intuitively reasonable. And wait for it. It says, in effect, that an extra unit of purchasing power should be spent in the same way, no matter to whom it is given. Now, that's not intuitively reasonable. It's intuitively rubbish. Okay. <laughs> It's obviously a case that that's not true. So as well as not knowing about money, economists also don't know about the distribution of income. Now, I think of course they're misinterpreting they... terms here. What he's saying is that it's intuitively reasonable that you need the if and only if, because what it is telling you is that the only way you can aggregate is indeed if an extra unit of purchasing power should be spent in the same way no matter to whom it is given. And that predates Hildenbrand's proof that changes in endowments will indeed violate the law of demand. Yeah. And Werner Hildenbrand based it in terms of favour. Yeah. So I think, you're, I think you're misinterpreting what he means by intuitively reasonable. He's not, not saying the condition is intuitively reasonable. Yeah. He's saying the theorem is intuitively reasonable. That's fair enough. OK, I can, take that, I can take that interpretation. But the real consequence then is that a single market can't be described as a single uh, person scaled up what happens at the market level is an emergent phenomenon. In other words, you can't work out what's going to happen by working out what an indiv individual does in isolation. You've got to look at the interaction between different agents. And that's the same thing at macro as well. Macroeconomics is not scaled up micro. It's fundamentally a different discipline. And this is something which is well known in general sciences, but not realised at all by economists who've been seduced by the vision of strong reductionism, of being able to reduce macroeconomics to applied micro. Now, this is known in sciences as the fallacy of strong reductionism. And again, I wish economists read more broadly, because if they took a look at the literature on, on science and where complexity theory has come from, that's a very, very strong theme. You cannot understand the behaviour of collective systems where there's interaction between the elements of that system by simply scaling up the individual isolated elements. So macro is not applied micro. And you can't deduce even a single market, let alone the entire economy, from that level. Now, the key paper on this in the science literature was Nobel Prize winner, and a real one, because he won a Nobel Prize in physics, Anderson, 
writing a paper called More is Different. And he said the behaviour of large and complex aggregates is not to be understood as a simple extrapolation of a few particles, let alone a single particle as we do in economics. That each, each new level, there's entirely new properties appear and you need new research which is as fundamental in its nature as any other. And he then said, well, you probably can rank the sciences in such a way as saying the elementary entities of one science obey the laws of another. So this is the table he put together. So chemistry obeys many, many body physics and molecular biology obeys chemistry and cell biology obeys molecular biology and so on, up to seeing the social sciences as psychology, which would have annoyed economists anyway. But he said that does not imply that science X is just applied Y. At each new level, new laws, concepts and generalisations are required, needing inspiration just as great as the previous level. And that applies within economics as well. Macroeconomics is not applied micro. And it's no wonder that economists miss the crisis by making that mistake. Now, I'm going to turn to an alternative approach now, and that comes from Hyman Minsky's work. And Minsky gave a very, very different vision of what economics should be about. He said, you don't have a decent theory of macro unless you can answer this question. And answer the question by the model itself being able to generate a Great Depression. He said, unless, you have a, unless your model can generate a Great Depression as one of its feasible states, it's not a model of a capitalist economy. And therefore, the neoclassical synthesis uh, leaves our capital assets, financing arrangements, banks, money creation, liabilities, and uncertainty. He says, to do better, we've got to abandon the synthesis, which I think is absolutely true. And we, have to, we can only learn that lesson by going through a crisis caused by not learning that lesson. So the alternative approach that I think we need has to treat the economy as inherently monetary. Money can't be assumed away. The model has to work in monetary terms. It has to be dynamic. Now, what economists do is, 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 is glorified statics at best, most of the time. It has to consider social classes rather than isolated agents. The belief that methodological individualism is correct is again false. And it has to have rational but not prophetic behaviour. If you gave the way that rational expectations is defined as a quiz in a TV show where you had to say what the word was you were defining, the sensible answer would be prophecy. What neoclassical economists mean by rational expectations is the capacity to accurately prophesize the future. I actually had a, a young, rather rabid neoclassical have a go at me when I gave this presentation in the Australian Economist. <coughs> he said, you're, what you're assuming is people are all idiots. And I said, do you, do you predict the, great, the financial crisis? And he said, no. I said, in that case, you've just defined yourself as an idiot. He didn't like that. Okay. You have to have endogenous creation of money and credit and debt have to have central roles and the model has to be able to generate a Great Depression. So I'll take you through Minsky's verbal model. Again, to get legitimacy in economics, you need to have a mathematical model. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to defend the use of mathematics in economics, unlike a lot of critics, but I'll talk about that in more detail later. So he starts with an economy in historical time. Now those two words don't exist in most neoclassical theories. They're neither in time nor in, certainly not in history. If you're in history, there's been a debt-induced crisis in the recent past. And the best example for us would be the recession of the 1990s. In the aftermath of that crisis, both firms and banks are conservative about the amount of debt they'll take on. And this is not asymmetric information, it's shared expectations about the future. Okay. Asymmetry doesn't explain it. So because they're both conservative, only conservative projects are put forward. But because the economy has also recovered from that crisis, most of those projects end up succeeding. And therefore, the outcome is that the firms and banks think, oh, if we'd been more leveraged, we would have made more money. So they revise the risk premiums upwards. And Minsky's classic phrase, stability is destabilizing. And what he means by that is you have a period of tranquil growth in a capitalist economy which is subject to uncertainty and has volatility in the past. That period of tranquility causes expectations to rise and behavior changes and destabilizes the system. Now, for a while, that's got some positive elements to it. Because you have a drop in risk aversion, there's more investment. But there's more investment, the economy does grow more quickly. And that's the sort of stuff that Schumpeter focused upon. But ultimately, you get to the stage of what Minsky called the euphoric economy. Now, I'd love to see somebody doing a research project how often the word euphoric was used to describe <coughs> expectations in the finance market by journalists who'd never read a word of Minsky until a couple of years ago. Um, in that era, 
speculation on assets becomes feasible. You can make money out of gambling on asset prices. And the money supply expands endogenously. I'll explain that in a moment. That, again, enables yet more risky behavior and more asset speculation. And you finally get what Minsky calls Ponzi financiers starting to dominate the system. And I think this will go down as the biggest Ponzi bubble in human history, the one we're living through right now. Now, Ponzi's by definition, by Minsky's definition, have a cash flow that's less than the debt servicing costs of they've got they've, put, they've taken on to actually buy the assets they have. So they can only make money by selling assets on a rising market. And before they sell them, the only way they can keep on going is by borrowing more money. So they become totally dependent upon growing debt levels. And they then, because of that, they'll pay any rate of interest to get their hands on money. They can't afford not to have new borrowed money coming in. Now that means rising debt levels and rising interest rates in the market system ultimately cause a crisis because those Ponzi investments are inherently loss-making. Okay. They're necessarily negative. They're getting an overhang of unsuccessful projects in the economy. And some of those projects which were conservatively estimated now become risky. So some of those investors think, well, there's a broad market out there for assets. Let's sell a few assets. And suddenly that growth in the asset market comes to a screaming halt because the market is nowhere near as broad as people think it is. And that rising trend of assets stops, and that's the end of the Ponzi's. They go bankrupt. They're the first ones to fold. Uh, back in 1987, the, one of the leading Ponzi's in Australia uh, was a guy called Laurie Connell. And Laurie Connell went bankrupt the day after the stock market crash. He was then rescued by a consortium of businessmen organised by Alan Bond. And Alan Bond notoriously put none of his own money into the rescue. And Laurie Connell finished his days doing paintings in the local prison. Now, they can't sell assets for a profit. Their debt servicing exceeds their cash flows. They're gone. Asset prices collapse. The debt to equity ratio rises initially because debt equity plunges below st stable debt. The expansion of the money supply goes into reverse. Investment evaporates. Economic growth slows. And you're back where you started. You're back in a debt-induced crisis. So that's Minsky's verbal model. Of course, we're in the extreme version of it because this process repeats and repeats with rising debt levels each time because capitalists and Ponzi's will borrow money during a boom and have to repay it part of it during a slump. But the fact you, you get recover each time means that repayment start, you, you start the next boom at a higher level of debt. And the ratcheting up process means ultimately you get to some point where there's so much debt that it overwhelms the economy. And that's where we've got to. That's what I saw coming back in, uh, 19, in 2005 and why I went public warning that a huge crisis was coming our way. Now, what I've tried to do is convert that from a verbal model into a mathematical one. And the theoretical foundation of the monetary bit comes from uh, combining Richard Goodwin's growth cycle model. Anybody here familiar with Richard Goodwin's growth cycle model? Good. Anybody else? A few, great. <laughs> Again, you should learn this sort of work. And Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, of course, with what's known as circuit theory. Now, this relates to the work of a bunch of uh, larger European post-Keynesian economists building a, trying to explain why money matters from first principles. And I call the product the monetary circuit theory. I've actually got to think a friend of mine for coining up the term, Mike Honeychurch, a, a Mathematica programmer who I work with. And the physical side of the economy is Goodwin's model. And uh, interestingly enough, that model was putting into mathematical form a verbal model that Marx had in Chapter 25 of Volume 1 of Capital, completely out of place because in most of Volume 1, he simply assumed that workers got uh, a fixed wage, a value, they got the value of labour power, and that was it. <coughs> but here he talked about a process by which you had a, a cyclical system giving you cycles in income distribution and employment, verbally, back in 1867. So 1967, Goodman put the whole thing together as a model which he saw as a predator-prey model. Well, I'll show you this model as a flowchart system. So it starts from saying the capital level of capital determines output by an accelerator relationship. And if you then divide that by uh, a productivity you work at, how many workers you need to hire to produce that output, divide that by the uh, population level, and you work out what the employment rate is, feeding that into a simple linear Phillips curve, in this instant example here, gives you the rate of change of wages. Integrate that and multiply it by the uh, number of workers you have and you've got the wage bill. Subtract that from profits and in the simple Goodwin model, all profits are invested. Integrate that and you've got the level of capital stock. 
So it's a closed model, and what it generates is something which is a commonplace in analysis of dynamic systems. It's got an unstable equilibrium. It will continually cycle, which is the characteristic of a predator-prey system. Curiously, by the way, the predators in this system are the workers and the prey are the capitalists. <laughs> Marxists don't like that one, the way it works. So what I've taken is taken that model and added in debt, because you've got to have debt in there as an essential part of having Minsky, and that's what Goodwin didn't include. Ironically, Richard Goodwin was, didn't believe that money mattered. He actually tried to persuade me not to do work on ringing in a monetary model a long, long time ago. Now, again, what I find amazing is that when, it, when neoclassicals do empirical work, they often get sensible conclusions. And this is coming out of Fama and French, who are two of the absolute promoters of the efficient markets hypothesis. They have since abandoned it, by the way, in 2004. Again, most economists don't seem to know that. Uh, but they said debt's the residual variable. Investment increases debt, and higher earnings tend to reduce it. And a similar finding again later on, that debt plays a key role in consolidating year-by-year -year variations in investment. So I bring this in two ways. By like first of all, having a nonlinear investment function. So in this low, low level of profit, you invest nothing. Uh, medium, you invest as much as you earn. A high level, you invest more than you earn, and therefore you have to borrow. And what that does is make the model more realistic, because capitalists do not destroy factories when the rate of profit turns negative. But if you have a linear relationship there, as Goodwin's model had, effectively you're saying when profit is negative, they go around destroying factories. No, they don't. So I use an exponential form for it, in which investment equals profit at 3%. It's greater than the profit rate at 3%, less and less, and less at 3 and uh, a negative uh, rate of 1% as a, a maximum negative, indicating depreciation in the absence of investment. And putting that into a flowchart form, which I think should be turning up in the slide somewhere. Uh-oh. Okay. Okay, that sounded good. That's what I was looking for. So that relationship now says investment minus profits gives you the change in debt. This is using flowchart software, which is commonplace in uh, engineering. Has anybody seen this sort of software before, using a flowchart to build a dynamic model? Okay, no engineers in the room. Okay. One engineer. Okay, good. Simulink? Pardon? What do you use? Simulink? No, no, I, I don't use it. Uh, but you have seen it? Yeah, okay. okay. Now, profit is now net in this model of both wages and interest payments. So I then subtract interest payments and wages from our from, uh, output to work out the rate of the level of profit. And then the whole model has this sort of behavior. Now, if I had my own computer running here, I could show you this and simulate this model live. I can't, unfortunately, do that. But this is showing the model close to, when you start close to equilibrium, and notice that becomes negative. That actually is like a positive bank balance for capitalists. So they're accumulating in this particular version of the model. And the equilibrium is stable. But it's stable in the sense that Fisher meant when he spoke about the behavior of the, of the American economy during the 1930s. And he said that we can tentatively assume that within ordinary limits, economic variables tend in a general way towards a stable equilibrium. So he's still hanging on to the belief that things happen in equilibrium. But he said, however, it's so delicately poised that after a departure from it beyond certain limits, instability is used. So an essential part of Fisher's explanation for the Great Depression was disequilibrium. And sure enough, if you start further from equilibrium in this, in this model, it's unstable. If you have a high initial level of, un of unemployment, then you get a series of cycles in debt. You can see the ratcheting up effect occurring in the model there, a series of cycles where the debt level rises, 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 finally goes through the roof, the economy collapses. Now, that's what's known as the inverse tangent route to chaos in a complex system, because in this particular class of chaotic models, the existence of the equilibrium depends upon the initial conditions of the model. If you start far enough away from the uh, initial condition from the equilibrium of the system, equilibrium disappears. And that's what happens in this simulation. So I wrote this paper back in uh, 1995 and had to explain a lot of the chaotic dynamics in the paper as well. And part of that is that if you have a, a nonlinear system and you're close to the equilibrium, then you can reduce that model to a series of quadratic equations where if you're very close to the center, it's like having a uh, having a, a quadratic where you're multiplying, you're, you're squaring and cubing and, and, and modeling the, raising a factor of four, a number less than one. And each time you do it, you get closer and closer to equilibrium. 
So if you have, if A is less than 1, then A cubed is less than A squared and so on. But above 1, A cubed is bigger, etc, etc. And the same thing applies here. If you start too far from the equilibrium, you move further away from it. The nonlinear stuff dominates and you have a collapse. Now, seeing that behaviour at the time, I writing this paper back in 1993 and publishing in 95, it's before what neoclassicals called the Great Moderation. So I finished the paper with a bit of a rhetorical flourish, or so I thought. I wrote that this vision of a capitalist economy of finance requires us to go beyond the habit of mind which Keynes described so well, the reliance upon a stable recent past as a guide to the future, and said the chaotic dynamics in the paper should warn us against accepting a period of relative tranquility in a capitalist economy as anything other than a lull before the storm. Well, gee, I'm glad I put that rhetorical flourish in, because what I got out of the model was this sort of behaviour. All the instability in unemployment, and in this particular, I didn't have inflation in the model, there's no price dynamics in this particular model, but that period of long stability was just a prelude to a period of rising instability and finally a breakdown. So then I brought in government, and this is worth raising at the moment because there is a role for government spending, though I don't think it's enough to work in this particular crisis. Because Minsky's way of looking at what the government did was it gave cash flow to firms that they wouldn't otherwise have during a downturn. With that cash flow, they could repay their debts. And equally, if you had progressive taxation, that would cut off ex uh, uh, euphoric expectations during a boom. Now, I modelled that by bringing in a subsidy, which can be negative when there's a, a need to stimulate the economy. And effectively, I had a government that towed the line against rising unemployment, turning up in this model. Now, clearly, that's the exact opposite of what governments have done. They've accepted a higher and higher level of unemployment over time. So the simple equation was just to say that the rate of change of government spending was some function of the employment rate. And feed that into the model, and with that, again, parameters feeding into an exponential function, uh, profit is now net of wages, interest, and government spending. And what I get out of that is cyclical instability. I'd love to be able to run the simulation and show you how that works, but I can't, can't do that with the, without the software installed on this computer. But instability in, in Minsky's terms wasn't the absence of cycles. Stability is the absence of breakdown. And if you had a government behaving this way, then the argument was it could stabilise the economy and stop it falling into the sort of slump we've seen. But that's a generous model because it leaves out what happens with asset markets and it leaves out governments that behave stupidly by following neoclassical theory. Now, that was the beginning of the model for me. I wanted to have a strictly monetary model. And the way of building that was given to me by reading Graziani's paper on circuit theory. And he said, how do we distinguish a monetary economy from a barter economy? With neoclassical theory, is fundamentally about a barter economy. And if you read David Graeber's work, there's never been any such thing. We have a model of a mythical economy. But we need a monetary one. So how do you distinguish a monetary one from a barter system? And Graziani said the starting point has to be you can't be using a commodity as money. Because if you are using a commodity as money, then anybody can go and produce it for themselves. So fundamentally, it's talking about another sort of barter economy. So said so to be monetary, you must be using something which is worthless, a token. And that, to me, was the essential insight, combined with the argument that uh, every exchange is actually three-sided. Rather than being two people, each trying to flog at different commodities to each other and working out an exchange ratio, which is the neoclassical vision, you have two people, one of whom is selling, the other is buying, and the buyer affects the sale, the purchase, by telling a bank to transfer money from the buyer's account to the seller's account. So he said every relationship in capitalism is three-sided. So I think it's a brilliant idea there. Now, neoclassical theory hasn't had <coughs> the wisdom to see that. They still see it as lending being simply a patient agent lending to an impatient one. And therefore, there's no change in aggregate demand from debt. So Krugman gives exactly that explanation in a recent paper and just says that um, there's no possibility of a crisis through the level of debt. It's just the distribution that can cause one. That's fundamentally wrong. That's the vision. The dollar goes from one person to another. No change in the aggregate spending power. And that's how Krugman tried to explain the crisis with a model that assumed that was the role of the monetary sector. Now, the real situation has been known for 40 or 50 years and that is that the way money is created is by an entrepreneur or a Ponzi merchant approaching a bank for a loan, 
and a bank saying that's a great idea, here's a million dollars, by the way, you owe us a million dollars. So you get simultaneous creation of an asset and a liability. And the it's not a case that deposits create loans, which is the standard argument of neoclassical theory, the money multiplier, but loans create deposits. And this is a, a, a senior vice president of the New York Fed back in 69. In the real world, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and look for the reserves later. That's the actual process of money creation, which means the increase in debt actually adds to spending power. Now, I model that using a strictly monetary framework. And the simple idea I realized was I could actually do this using simple double entry bookkeeping. So I've got a loan, and I've been modeling 19th century banking here, so a transfer of notes from a reserve account across the deposits, recording of the loan, paying interest on it, um, charging interest on it, paying the interest, recording the interest, paying wages, etc., etc. That then is fed into a software package that generates a system of differential equations. And I could never, in a million years, explain the equations to you, but I think I can read the table back to you and you, you follow the logic. You follow the logic in the table and accept that, you actually understand the equations that are generated, which look like that. I'm not about to try to explain those, it's just to show that there's some mathematics behind this. So, I then couple that with the physical economy by having a price equation, which gives you lag convergence to um, the uh, prices being a markup over wage costs. A monetary Phillips curve that includes all three factors that Phillips spoke about in the paper. Again, Phillips is massively misinterpreted. He didn't just have the unemployment rate, he had the rate of change of unemployment and the cost of living adjustment. So that's fit in there. Those two equations together let me link that with the Phillips curve. And what I end up with a bit of a monster. I'll let that roll past. This is all in continuous time, differential equations, uh, none of the nonsense of theory of analysis that seems to dominate even non-neoclassical economics. And out of that, I get a model that generates both the Great Moderation and the Great Depression, with rising debt causing it. So I fit the stylized facts of the crisis we've been through. Because if you actually look at what happened, this is now looking at the unemployment, inflation, and debt to GDP data, smoothing it over time. And I'm pretty happy with the correspondence at a qualitative level between what my model generates and what we actually got in the real world. So. It's also possible to extend this to multiple commodities. That monster's a 41 equation system that models a, uh, a four sector economy and generates an inherent limit cycle. Which again, I had no idea this was going to happen when I first put the model together. But I'm getting a complex uh, multi sectoral uh, dynamic out of it, which involves the dynamics in the financial sector as well as dynamics and distribution of income. Now, that is pretty inaccessible stuff. So part of what I'm trying to do as well with the grant for MyNet is to make that accessible by producing a model that enables you to build a system like that without even knowing you're doing differential equations. And there's a draft version on my website called QED. I think I can actually bring that up over here. I'm running close to out of time, aren't I, John? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Okay, let's see if I can bring this up. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong keyboard, that doesn't help, does it? Okay. So that's the system I've showed you there a moment ago, and if I can find where I put the mouse, let's just see if I can see my it. That is built by putting together a table of financial flows, and it then generates the dynamics I showed you in that, you can see on the static graph a moment ago, where what you get is apparently a great moderation occurring in inflation and unemployment, but if you go back and take a look at what's actually driving the whole thing, it's a debt bubble which ultimately leads to a collapse, which is where we've got ourselves to now. So I think we're in for a, a sustained period of deleveraging and of continual failure to get out of this recession until debt levels are back to about one-sixth of what they got to be at their peak. And Africa demand will always be falling below it. The government deficits will try to attenuate the decline, but they'll be less effective because they'll be fighting a, public, a private sector deleveraging at the same time they're trying to stimulate it. And of course, hysteria will make things worse because you'll have two factors pulling demand out of the economy. We're better off abolishing the private debt because it should never have been issued in the first place. Honouring it is going to keep us trapped in a Great Depression permanently. And of course, we got here courtesy of bad economic thinking. So I'd like to finish on that note uh, by saying something from one of John's recent papers that I very much enjoyed. We need evidence-based macro replacing faith-based models, which is what we've had. And we need to be 
less exclusionary than what we do and don't look at because neoclassicals still aren't taking a serious look, not only at Minsky, but at people like myself who have been working at Minsky for 20 years. And we should use the data to test the theory. And amen to that. Thank you. Sorry for going so quickly. Well, that's a huge program that you've described. Uh, right, the questions. Yeah. Mm. Thanks for your talk. Um, I think I, I definitely buy the idea that depth is very important mm. in the models. Um, you seem to be saying, if I've got you right, that uh, actually the gross level of depth matters. Yes. Regardless of the distribution. I mean, the distribution yeah. bit isn't immaterial, but um, I'm, I'm struggling to see how that can be the case because if you imagine a sort of the extreme scenario where that everyone owes everyone. You can have very imagine a two-person economy, and, and each person owes each other the same amount. Each person has a net debt of zero, and so there's no impact on their wealth. Which is exactly the mistake that neoclassical thinkers make by seeing debt as being an exchange between two agents when it's actually between three. No, but the bank is then the owner of the debt. So the bank creates a, uh, an asset, uh, a sort of if you like a power oh. relationship over people who borrow. So I'm not saying there's yeah. two consumers at the end. Yeah. It may be that the bank is the endpoint, but it's still there's still a contract between two people. It's two parts. Two one, one is that the that, that is again taking a time a time slice approach and saying at a particular point in time, assets equal liabilities, therefore there's no problem, which is exactly the case that Krugman made in his most recent paper. But what's leaving out is the dynamic process that the inc the level of demand is not just the income of those two agents; it's also the change in debt over time. So part of your economic growth is actually due to rising debt levels. So your level of economic activity, which includes sales of goods and services as well as activity on asset markets, involves a rising level of debt. So that, that rising level of debt is where the distribution changes. You get an uneven distribution. It isn't the distribution, it's the aggregate level. I, I, I couldn't well, get the correlations. If, 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 put, yeah, put the, aggregate, way. the aggregate level yeah. does change. But if it was only that, there would be no impact on the net wealth of the individuals. That well, if that was the case, I couldn't get the correlations I'm getting out of the data. It, it, it's hard to get your head around first time round, but and you have to look at it from a point of view of endogenous money, where the expansion in the money in the debt level actually generates demand. Well, I don't see that the the data could ever falsify what I'm saying because, in fact, the distribution of wealth and debt in the economy is demonstrably very uneven. So we've never had an economic set of economic data where uh, the distribution of debt is is even in the way I'm describing that. I yeah, think. it's the aggregate level of debt matters because, as I've shown there, if you go from rising debt, where whoever's taking out the debt, to falling debt, you can go for a 40% change in aggregate demand in one year. Yeah. That's big. But that's because uh, the falling debt falls on the poorest. No. Who are the ones who owe? No. It's the, it, it's, it's the, the, ma the major reduction in debt's been made by the hedge funds. They've gone, it's the finance sector doing most of the deleveraging in America. It's not the poor who are doing it. It really comes down to the aggregate level of debt because change in the le aggregate level of debt is a change in your aggregate demand. I know it's hard to get your head around, but it really is the aggregate level that matters. Distribution is important, but secondary. Steve, you must have heard the lovely story explaining QE2. Yeah. That uh, this American turns up in a hotel in Southern Ireland and oh, wants yeah. to see a room, and he puts down a hundred euro bill as deposit when he wants to see the room. Mm. The hotelier runs down the road and pays off mm. the prostitute. She runs down yep. the road and yep. pays off the baker. Comes all the way back, gives a hundred euro bill back. The American comes down and says, I'm not taking the room. He walks away with the euro. All debts are cancelled. There's no change in aggregate demand yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. So I don't see your story. Um, that is a liquidity crisis. Yeah, well, a lot of but if you, yeah, you, yeah, it's also a static story because the American turns up once and leaves. Sure. Now, if the American happens. turns up every day and, and spends 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, and the economy gets based on that demand being what actually employs everybody in the system, and when the American disappears, aggregate demand falls 40%. It's well, the dynamic by story. Then it hasn't generated the wealth for other people to continue with aggregate demand. Right, I by the end of that point. I think I'd better come back for a longer seminar in that case. So I'm, ad I'm, I'm, I'm adamant about that process being it's, it's not the distribution that is primary. The yeah. primary is the growth and the aggregate level of debt because that is giving you additional demand. Uh, again, Sean Pater gives an excellent... Read Sean Pater's theory of economic development and see how he explains it back in 1934. He says that increasing debt is what actually finances entrepreneurial demand. If you only have demand coming out of the circulation of commodities, then all you can really find is a constant level of economic activity. <laughs>
you're going to have growth in demand, you've got to have entrepreneurs receiving funding. When they get that funding, they boost aggregate demand. When their products then come into the into uh, realization, they undercut other sectors of the economy, pay back the debt, and drive aggregate demand down. And he's got that debt finance cycle driving aggregate demand. The same thing in Minsky, only talking about Ponzi financiers. And when you get to the scale of the level of debt we're at now, and you go from adding 28% in 2007 to subtracting 18% in 2008, it's not the distribution that changed. It was the rate of growth of the aggregate debt that changed and drove the system down. Let's, let me add some empirical yep. evidence yep. on this. Um, in our work on, on, on consumer behaviour, uh, yep. we find that the marginal propensity to spend out of debt is of the order of eight times as large as margin, um, the NPC to spend out of, out of stock market wealth. Mm. Um, and also a lot larger than the marginal propensity to spend out of, out of housing wealth. Mm. So when the American households accumulated this, this massive household debt, mm. um, they were then made bundled by the fact that asset prices fell. Because yeah. The backing for the debt um, wasn't there. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, they found that they couldn't reduce debt in the, in the short run. They had to service debt. Mm. They had negative equity um, in terms of their assets. And uh, lo and behold, they had to cut um, consumption. Mm. Mm. So, you know. Yeah. From, from data on households, you, you, can, you can get some of the story. Yeah, you can um, see that feedback. Yeah. That, that may well be true on the household side, but you keep yeah. talking about entrepreneurs and you keep yeah. talking yeah. as if this massive expansion in aggregate debt was used to finance business investment. Mm. And we just know that's not true. 3% of UK corporate uh, lending, uh, of UK bank lending, goes to corporate, uh, non financial corporate borrowers. Mm. Okay, so 97% of it was doing other stuff. And that's the sign of how Ponzi our entire financial well, system that, has become. That, 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 that's fine, but... Uh, you know, I'm talking, of, I'm going back to Schumpeter's analysis back in the 30s and talking about the role, actually in the 20s as well, the role that change in debt should be to basically finance entrepreneurial activity. And now what you've got is an entire financial sector that's made its money by financing Ponzi behaviour rather than that. I mean, one of the classic instances there is uh, when Basil Moore first did the empirical work on endogenous money back in the 60s and 70s, uh, a major illustration he used was the role of a line of credit in why the money supply expands according to the demands of borrowers. And he said firms negotiate lines of credit, which are rather like your bank, your MasterCards, with uh, many, many banks. And when they need to pay a larger wage bill or pay a larger amount of money for resources, they simply access that line of credit. They don't need to go and ask for another loan. Now, Fast forward to where we are now, and lines of credit have almost died out, the reason being banks are charging far too high a rate of interest for them. So instead to get their short-term money, literally to pay wages and you know, immediate expenses, corporations started to issue commercial paper. And Lerman Brothers then cornered the commercial paper market. And the reason why Lerman's collapse was so catastrophic was suddenly the money to pay wages disappeared overnight in America. So. That's saying that there's been a transition in the behaviour of the financial sector from doing what they should do, which is back with the entrepreneurial funding and lines of credit and so on, through to being almost utterly speculative in what they're doing right now. I kind of missed that in your model. It, it looked like they were financing capital. Between in that particular and model, that's what I've done. This is a foundation model. What I'm working on now is building an asset price system inside there. I could ask exactly I've got that, that as well. No asset prices in it. The stuff you showed us. Yeah, that's because that's it's still crucial. well. It's it's there, but I, I don't want to show you the massive okay. equations that came out of it. That gave me 21 equations for the basic system, and I'm still work. I've got I've got these cycles in the asset uh, price market. I haven't yet got the bubbles there because I haven't built in borrowing to buy shares as yet. So this all takes time to do, unfortunately. Yeah. On, on a rather different topic, you say we'd be better off abolishing private debt. Yeah. How's that going to happen? What What would it look like? Well, what it would look like is like a large-scale version of what started happening in, under Roosevelt in the 1930s as well, because there were general write-offs in debt levels. You were simply banks were instructed to reduce debt levels. That happened during the bank holiday back at that period. So as well as the banks being shut down for a substantial period and then reopening later, they also, during that time, had their books reorganised and a large part of the debt burdens started to be written off. The bad way to go about it, but the usual way, unfortunately, is bankruptcy. If you didn't have bankruptcy, you wouldn't get out of this crisis. But bankruptcy, of course, reduces the spending power of people who are creditors of the, of the bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So that means you get a, a chain reaction effect, which is what made the Great Depression really, really great. 
So you've got to have debt abolition. The, the, the irresponsible lending was done by the lenders, not by the borrowers. And you find it quite hilarious that there's this ideological argument that the borrowers are irresponsible and they shouldn't be able to walk away from their debts. When you're talking about Ma and Pa Kettle in Tennessee, taking out a loan issued by a bank with a thousand mathematics PhDs working out the derivatives on which the loan was based. You know, the irresponsibility came from the finance sector and the finance sector should wear the opprobrium and if that means they have to get re restructured and, and uh, uh, go into receivership for a while until their debts are reorganised and their behaviour is reorganised, that's what has to happen. That, that will also hit the wealth of a lot of people who have nothing to do other than having pension. Absolutely. I mean, I think we're, we're going to find a lot of our wealth is fictional mm -hmm. because a huge part of the apparent wealth of people for retirement has been based on capital appreciation on the stock market. So we've actually been financing our retirement through a Ponzi scheme. Now, when we finally wash that all through and see what's left, and there is no asset appreciation anymore, and, of course, demand is also hit by a lower rate of growth courtesy of the impact of deleveraging on demand, then there's going to be lots of people having far poorer retirements than they thought they were going to have. Yes. And that, for that reason, I expect a lot of political ramifications out of this crisis, rather than just simply economic. Yeah. So, speaking up on that point right now, yeah. the, the, the crucial part uh, to understand here is that uh, it seems that, particularly in Europe and I think in the United States, uh, the political sector is doing everything it can to protect the creditors. Yeah. And um, this is a delusion, actually, because the more vociferous they are about protecting the creditor class against any defaults, uh, the more likely it is that the whole thing will collapse in a hugely spectacular way. Yeah. So in that, exactly that sense, there is this attempt to continue this fiction that this is real money, mm -hmm. but it actually cannot be maintained. Yeah. There is, however, an attempt to try to deleverage the economy by squeezing the peasant class so that the, the creditor class can maintain you know, its income from these debt obligations by yeah. reducing government services, reducing wages, bringing people out of work Which will cause so political revolt and right-wing coups again, as yeah. they did back in the 1930s. That's right. It also reduces aggregate demand. So once again, yeah. it's an illusion. It it's, it's just doesn't add up. Yeah. And being able, if you can show that, if we can show that with a model that you're developing, so the, the math of yeah. the fact that there, there is no way out other than ultimately writing down a lot of these debt, clearing it out of the system. Yeah. That will be a hugely useful contribution, particularly if you can show that that leaves the economy as a whole better off than driving the whole thing over a cliff in a desperate effort to In a stylized way, I can. But it's yeah. just doable. If you do that in a um, not-so-stylized way, yeah. uh, in a populist fashion, yeah. that would Huge be job. a very powerful rallying cry. Extremely. <laughs> Extremely. He has to translate it for me exactly. to <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, David Grave is doing that right now in the, in the, in the Washington, uh, the, the siege of, uh, New, of, of, of Wall Street. And I think that's extremely important stuff. It won't be that this is what causes the revolution, but it's certainly the beginning of the revolt. For what is so. good, I think a movie needs to be made that explains this in a way that's really accessible to modern <laughs> cattle. That can be done. Yeah. That can be done. Yeah, I, the way I see your story is that um, it seems like there's a failure of the Modigliani Miller at the aggregate level, at the firm level, and at the bank level. Yeah. But if that's so, what, what's exactly the friction that is causing that? Because the, model, the model simply has the impact of rising debt levels, reducing profitability, and then leading to a crisis because there are phase differences in any dynamic system where you'll have a boom occurring, meaning you take on more debt, and the, inc more debt and the increased demand that causes drives up employment, which leads to an increase in wages you weren't expecting, and the cash flow you've got to serve that debt is less than you thought you'd have, and that causes a, a turning point. So that's the fundamental dynamic going on there. But at a certain point, the amount of uh, the impact of that combination of, of squeezes on the level of profit is such that what's left uh, means the debt accumulates faster than you can then repay it. And then you get an explosion in debt and a collapse of the system. And fundamentally, the only way out of that was something I haven't yet modeled, which is bankruptcy. But that's, of course, something which extends the length of time the downturn takes. So what would your policy recommendations then be to try and avoid this? Ha so let's say we had the yeah. reset, and then assuming we can remember, because it sounds like it's a kind of a, it's, it's a collective memory issue. Exactly. We forget what happened in the past. Yeah. You know, I mean, how, how do you try to avoid that to that's, that's two, two generations down the line? Yeah. I mean, I, I had a, when I first presented this model at my own university back in 96, one of the very neoclassical members of staff, uh, we walked out of the room and said, Steve, the difference between you and me is I believe people learn from their mistakes. 
And I said, yes, Andrew. And the other difference between you and me is I believe people forget and die. <laughs> Uh, now, of course, that what happened from the Great Depression because no way would anybody in 1933 in the Congress have voted for the abolition of Glass-Steagall if they were there in 1999. That's a classic case of forgetting the lessons of the past. So you have to have a reform which actually locks in the behaviour. And I don't think you rely upon regulators and regulations and, uh, and you know, policy control, like even reserve, increasing reserve requirements, because when boom times come along, people who've never experienced it will be in charge and we'll see those are silly obsolete things from a past time. So my, I have two recommendations because I don't think you can stop the banks from wanting to lend money. It's impossible. And they make money by creating debt. They're always going to try to entice us into more debt. And the reality is debt is not a good thing to have. It's necessary for a capitalist economy. You need debt for, I'm not saying it's, you shouldn't have debt at all, but debt per se is a bit like having a tooth pulled. You don't want to have too many teeth taken out unless you're silly enough to go to the dentist and be convinced you look sexier with less teeth. And then you'll have more teeth taken out than you actually need. Well, that's what's happened with debt. Banks have persuaded us that you'll make more of a gain on whatever you're doing, like speculating on house prices, by borrowing more money, by being more levered. So it makes debt seem attractive, and therefore you take on far more debt than you should. So we have to stop making debt attractive beyond what it should be, which is providing you know, what entrepreneurs need, they have the Steve Jobs of the world. And, uh, and what um, working capital is needed by firms and a small amount of finance for housing. You, you need all those three. But to stop it being used for speculating on assets, you've got to make leverage speculation unattractive. So I have two ideas, one of which I call Jubilee shares. And the idea there is that you, a share continue, you shares continue with existing exactly as they are now until a share was sold to another speculator. And as soon as it's sold to a speculator, it lasts 50 years and then it dies. So you get 50 years of dividends out of it, voting rights, everything else, but in 50 years' time it terminates. Now that would, all, I hope, eliminate, virtually eliminate, people borrowing money to gamble on the secondary market on shares. They might still borrow it to get involved in an IPO, but they wouldn't borrow to buy shares off another speculator. So that would eliminate that attractiveness. And the second proposal I call the PIL, which stands for Property, uh, property Income Limited Leverage. The idea being, rather than basing the amount of money you get for a property on the rent on the income of the borrower, which banks always game and, and borrowers have an interest in getting a larger amount of money to beat somebody else buying a property, set it to be a maximum, say, ten times the annual rental income of the property itself. So, if you have a property which is uh, earning twenty-five thousand pounds a year as rental, then the most anybody could get to borrow to buy it, myself or George Soros, would be a quarter of a million pounds. And therefore, if George wanted to buy it more than I did, he'd put more of his own money into it, and you get a negative relationship between house prices and leverage. And then if we got those two institutions, banks would never develop the power they have done over time, because the power of the banks actually comes from the level of debt they generate. And when you're back in the 1940s and 50s, when they had almost you know, trivial levels of debt, 50% of GDP in America, they had no political power. It was the industrialists who dominated American capitalism. Now fast forward to today, and who are the industrialists? Whereas the bankers dominate. Others, others actually going around suggesting uh, that full reserve banking is a solution to this, where every year the growth in the money supply instead of being generated endogenously through extension of credit by the yeah. commercial banking system, uh, that the central bank would issue an additional 3% or so to mm -hmm. the money supply through fiat money, through spending on infrastructure. Yeah. And that, that would also eliminate uh, these problems. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, the proposal. The American Monetary Institute puts that idea forward, and they've got quite a sophisticated act before Parliament about it. It would work. Uh, I have two problems about it. One is that I think it's addressing not the real cause of the problem, which is lending money per se isn't, isn't bad. Lending money for bad activities like speculating on asset prices is where the problem comes from. But it wouldn't eliminate lending. It wouldn't eliminate lending, I know, but it, what it would, wouldn't eliminate either is lending on asset markets. Unless it's also linked in with... Uh, eliminating the attractiveness or the, of, of lending to asset market speculation, you'll still get bubbles in that system. And when the bubble crashes, the bankers will blame the bubble on the government not creating enough money and say, we, would, we did it better when it was privatised. So you People will forget, you'll get back into the same system again. In, exposing you then you took this uh, full reserve banking model plus your fix against... That's feasible. I'm, I'm just At the same time, I don't, I don't mind banks being private. Uh, and I have a fairly strong scepticism about how bureaucrats would manage money creation. So I'd, I'd rather have private intelligence being devoted to the area. 
uh, but limited from becoming private speculation rather than private intelligence. So um, but for that reason... But banking does not exclude private banking at all. It just says that... But it, it, it hands over responsibility for the rate of growth of the money supply to the bureaucrats in the reserve banks and the treasuries. And, you know, I, I have almost as much faith in their capacity to stuff up as they have in Ponzi merchants to cause a disaster. I would have more faith in them than in the J.P. Morgan guy. Oh, definitely more than the J.P. Morgan. I want to see them eliminated. But it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it comes down to getting banks back to the role they used to have, of being relationship banking and assessing whether a particular idea from a particular investor was worth backing or not, which, of course, they've completely lost now. It's all a question of what's your asset backing and, you know, get a loan over the internet type stuff, which is entirely the wrong model for banking. Great. I think we must stop. But okay. Thank you very much indeed. That was, um, thank you. Most stimulating. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I'll turn my technology off. Will that be available online later? Yeah.